we got a few updates for you on AI and tech. SpaceX Starship aims to be a fully reusable transport system designed to carry both cargo and transport to Earth orbit, the Moon, Mars, and beyond. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, it is really interesting. The race to Mars is really taking... It's on. starting to happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They have finally come up with a rocket which can go basically anywhere to for currently for anywhere we have Mars, right? So it is pretty good and all of that fuel in one go and taking also cargo with a reusable rocket. Yeah, reusable is the big thing because yeah. NASA had a, had a go at it. Um, they had 64 years to kind of make it run efficiently. Um, but at the end of the day, their reusable STS boosters were only used two times. Whereas SpaceX has already managed to get their Starship to be reused 10 times. But they're, trying, they're pushing it so that that particular Starship is used 100 times with minimal refurbishment. Um, and I think that that's a really big deal because we have exorbitant costs with producing these shuttles, these um, Starship systems. And when you also talk about the weight capacity that these shuttles have, I mean, 100 tons is massive. So just looking at that little bit of information that was kind of gleamed through what is possible and what they're working on developing, I'm actually excited about space exploration. Like I think with this kind of system, we can start seeing large cargo capacities being shipped to Earth's orbit, which can then be reassembled and then prepared for going on longer distance trips like the moon, like Mars, and who knows? Yeah, and uh, it will be just, uh, what I think is, it will be just the start when we, land on mars see once we land on land mars, on the moon because if 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 we have a privatized <laughs> commercial um enterprise mm -hmm. arriving at the moon that's a big deal because so far it's just been governments but then when you also increase the frequency of that you're having more trips to earth's orbit more trips to the moon mm -hmm. they're cheaper they're faster they're easier to manage because of all of the cost reduction that's being dealt with and the efficiency that's being put in place. Mm -hmm. That's a big deal because back then, NASA would have their shuttles land on the ocean like their reusable um, modules would fall at sea. And so recovery of those modules are, are expensive. But when you have them landing by themselves in a controlled way back into the landing pad, that means the recovery expenses are, are recovered or maintained or prevented. So I think that that's an interesting um, development that they've been working on for a long time. But I'm really excited and I think that this is going to be um, a possibility where we may actually get true space exploration in a way that we didn't really expect and it may happen probably within 20 or 30 years. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the best thing about that is the 100 tons of cargo so this means we can start yes. colonizing moon, Mars, whatever it is really fast. And the thing is, it is why I say it, it will be just a start. Uh, if you uh, like apart from a tourist point of view, if you see it as a scientific exploration, if you once reach to Mars and you want to go further. Yeah, so think about like asteroids, for example, which are in, in our orbit or even a little bit closer to closer than Mars that's a possibility because the resources that are in that are on asteroids yeah once we reach anywhere and the best thing about both moon and Mars is they both have water so wa that's we right. can harness the water we can create hydrogen oxygen which we both need for a space exploration hydrogen absolutely. for fuel oxygen for breathing absolutely then we can go even further yeah that is so amazing so that will just be start so let's see how it goes. Let me ask you this. If you had the possibility, right, to go to the moon or to go to Mars using these reusable systems in a commercialized enterprise like SpaceX, would you choose to go to Mars? Would you choose to go to the moon? Mars. 
you are more courageous than I am. <laughs> I, th I think I would try a, a trip to the moon. I think it's shorter. I take it yeah. as no matter what happens, no matter it doesn't. At least you tried, right? At least I tried. I, uh, even, if a, yeah. I'm, even if I'm in space, that is like dream come true. It doesn't I matter. I know what are the risks. It is very risky business, right? Right. I am ready to take it. If, so, if somebody okay. is listening and want a guy to fly into space, here it is. he is. I will do whatever is required. Gladly go Absolutely. to Mars. Yeah, so, okay. Let's talk about another subject here. White House secures safety commitments from eight more AI companies, the likes of which Adobe, Nvidia, Cohere, IBM, Palantir, Salesforce, Scale AI, and Stability AI. Now, there's three core principles that are the main points that the White House wanted these companies to volunteer those commitments. What are they? So I uh, wrote them down actually because they were pretty solid points. So the first point is ensure products are safe before uh, introduction. So you see all the policies right now, e not even just in like US, UK and many other countries. You would find many articles on internet uh, like specifically talking about it. They are really uh, pushing AI. Mm -hmm. but also being uh, being very cautious about it uh, the potential harms of ai right so no, no i do no government wants to be behind in that so they are really pushing it so ensuring product products are safe before introduction this point i think is regarding that then another one is building system with security as a top priority again the same thing Right. Uh, and maintain a strong commitment to keeping the public's trust. That and is... That's important. Yes. That's important but because if you think about it, governments, I think they've been acting in a very mature way in allowing AI development to take on the course that it's taken, which has been very open and I think non-restrictive. But the governments are well aware of the potential dangers that AI poses. Like, I think there's been enough advisors mm -hmm. that have reached key officials and told them, hey, this is a really big problem. But what the governments have realized over time is that these technologies, they cannot be completely eliminated or reduced in terms of their development. But what they can, what the governments can do is they can create goodwill with the big companies that have the capacities to develop potentially powerful AIs and help them in regulating themselves and managing the key restrictions that need to be put in place so that these AI technologies can successfully become both harmless and beneficial to the public at large. And it's important that big companies volunteer these commitments because we, the public does need to have trust in these big companies in rolling out these technologies in a safe way. And I think these companies are, are they're doing a good thing by volunteering and making these commitments. Time will tell if they hold up to those commitments. Yeah, that's yeah. the thing to see. One of the uh, most complex thing and really important thing is about the storage of the data. Like, <laughs> where will you store the data? Some AI in UK is some bank uh, AI fra for fraud detection. Right. Is using the uh, is it allowed to train its models in uh, for the let's say US data? Mm -hmm. So that kind of things are really important. And yes. That what uh, for me that is what will define the trust. Like where is my data? At end of the day, I think every country should. Uh, that is my personal thinking should try to keep the data in their own land like it's definitely a big part for yeah. sure data privacy is super important <laughs> and I think that some of these companies even though they may have had policies that incorporated privacy it does go a long way to improve upon those commitments to public trust to make sure that privacy is 
one of the key core components of maintaining that trust. So let's talk about a subject that I know you're a lot more familiar than I am. ML Perf Inference version 3.1 introduces new LLM and recommendation benchmarks. So flesh this out, tell me what your thoughts are on these kind of benchmarks. So uh, basically what this is, this is, so uh, you see there are many AI related companies now. We have Chat GPT and we have Claude. Right. Right. So they all are presenting AI model and they are all pushing in different aspects of the business. Like it is not like if somebody is good with image generation, they on only want to do that. Mm -hmm. They want to go to uh, maybe text based AI or anything. Right. So now, uh, how do you judge a model, what the company is presenting, how good it is? Because it is good in, let's say, image generation. Now they are Correct. pushing for text generation. But Correct. how do you then yes. Is it really good? Maybe it is just good with image generation. Right. So there was not a... There were no underlying benchmarks already in yeah, place. Yeah, there were. So this is, uh, this basically is a version 3.1. So it right. is like the new improvement. That's right. So, uh, and the thing is, you see, they are also using now GPUs and different GPUs are there. So let's say one AI is using GPU of some different kind mm -hmm. and another AI model is using of type B. So how do you compare it, the performance of AI? Because the hardware is different, right? That's right. So yeah. considering all that factors, they have come up with certain benchmarks. Uh, in a same way, if right. uh, in a same way, if you want an example, how the ISO certification works. For so it works in a similar vein to those benchmarks. Yes, yes, kind of okay. the same way. You need okay. to get ISO certification, so you have following the norms. So it is kind of playing the same uh, role. Do you think this is going to increase competition? Uh, the thing, it is gonna. Because I would think so. I mean, I, th I think that there's going to be an agreed upon scoring. And I think <laughs> that this increased competition may be a thing um, and accelerate the process of key domains with agreed scoring methods. So I will tell you this. Uh, that's uh, I am yet to see. Will it increase compet This particular thing will increase competition or not. But for sure, it will standardize the competition like it'll make it a standard uh, yeah. that the competition or different companies have to try to meet yeah that sounds to me like that it may it may potentially increase competition i think mm -hmm. i i think it's it potentially going to go that way sure um and i hope it does because increased competition is going to mean better improvements mm -hmm. in these ai models so yes. that's this is an interesting development so Apple's latest AI development, device integration, and this is kind of a little bit of Apple integrating their AI with some of their hardware. Like you have the iPhone and the watch where there's going to be an increase in making tasks easier and making photos better, which doesn't sound like a big development because Apple isn't trying to shout that they're using AI. The really interesting thing about this uh, whole AI and Apple thing is they are being secretive about it. So regarding that, I have a question for you. Sure. Why do you think Apple is being like not whoever is playing the AI game right now? Let's say Google. All the publicized. They really companies. publicize it. Yeah. Why do you think that is not the case with Apple? The reason why Apple is flying under the radar when it comes to AI is a really simple answer. Apple wants to surprise its customer and it wants to surprise its customer with a really innovative use for AI as it relates to the hardware that they're trying to promote, which happens to be at this point Vision Pro. And you would think that Vision Pro <laughs> is a consumer product, but it isn't. It's, it is, in a way, but realistically, it's a test. It's a test on what the hardware is going to have in terms of a reaction of the consumer base and the developers that are familiarized with these technologies. I think the Vision Pro 
and the name speaks for itself, vision, is that vision is supposed to lend inspiration to a whole host of different developers that can see the technologies, see the possibilities, and start to roll out some of these technologies that can be potentially integrated with AI and produce some really remarkable results. This is the secret sauce of Apple. And Apple has learned from its previous experiences where it has introduced a new hardware that had never been seen before, like their consumer grade PCs. Back a few decades back, they created a PC that didn't really sell off that well. But from that, a whole host of different applications and developments kind of sprang out of nowhere. And all of a sudden, everybody wants the consumer PC. Everybody wanted to get onto the internet because they saw the potential. And I think that with the Vision Pro, they're really hoping that this is gonna be the next frontier. It may not necessarily be the Vision Pro, but it will be a future development of the Vision Pro that is maybe a bit more form factor friendly, not the visor in front of your face kind of thing. And that's really gonna be an impressive development. But for that to happen, Apple wants to go back to its previous experiences and bring out another moment where that happens, similar to the iPhone. Yeah, I think it is really interesting what you said because uh, now that I think about it, how the Vision Pro is, the number of sensor it has. Right now, I'm not sure if uh, how much of AI they are using into it, but if they want to make an AI interface device, that has all the hardwares you would yes. need. Yeah, so, I mean, the Vision Pro, the level of development that went into building that thing is crazy. But they're not planning on selling a lot of models. In fact, if I remember correctly, and I could be wrong, but they're only trying to sell a million units of that model for $3,500. It's a significant amount of money for that kind of hardware when you see the Oculus going for $300 or $400. So it's like 10x what you know, a VR headset is worth. And a lot of consumers are probably gonna say no. But Apple is not creating this product for that purpose. And yeah. I think that that's gonna really <laughs> bring out some interesting results um, in development later on down the line that may really create some powerful products that we actually will adopt. Yeah, yeah. Apple is not about making the customer, like if the customer says no, Apple is like, we will make them say yes, yes. our way. Yes. So, uh, and I have alternate theory for this too, why they are being silent about AI. Okay. I think you would find it interesting. So there was a survey which said that 45% of uh, uh, US adults are equally excited and cautious about AI. Oh, okay. And the thing with Apple UI and iPhone is, it is, uh, the people who are not into too much customizing of their phone are a bit skeptical about new flashy things. Right. Really like Apple. That has been a trend for some time, at least in US and Western world, let's say. I can see that. So uh, why to, uh, if advertising it too much will may harm their, like 45% of adult is a huge chunk of US population. It so, is. So that is just a theory. I yeah. think yeah. it may be the case. I'm super curious to know what Apple is working behind the scenes with when it comes to AI. Mm -hmm. um, I can appreciate a little bit of secretiveness at this point because AI is becoming ubiquitous at this point and there's no secret as to why that is. Mm -hmm. But I, so I like the fact that Apple's kind of working on this behind the scenes and really kind of trying to come out with something revolutionary. Um, Apple, despite the fact that their products are not something that I adopt personally, I do appreciate their innovation and their design, and I think they're going to come out with something surprising. You just got to give them time. And one thing that Apple's really good at is they're very patient when it comes to developing a good product, but when they do, they really do surprise it. So to jump onto another topic, Coca-Cola is getting on the AI bandwagon they've produced, uh, they've co-produced a new beverage called the Y3000. And we actually happen to have it right here with us because we need to appreciate when 
even a traditional company like Coca-Cola rolls out with something that's AI based. And I think it's, I think it's an interesting concept. They basically introduced a new flavor that they've co-created with AI. And some of their image um, generation has been introduced into the design of the Coca-Cola um, graphics. So I kind of like it. I like, I like that refreshed look of Coca-Cola. So it's cool to see an old company like Coca-Cola, who's been around for a pretty long time, kind of try to adopt AI because even a traditional company can benefit from it. And I think Coca-Cola understands that. So have you tried the Coca-Cola um, beverage yet or? No, pro, let's. Neither have I. So let's give a, a little taste test. I'm tasting this and it's actually not bad. I'm surprised that I actually liked it. I don't know how you feel about it, but this is that bad. Uh, the first thing is I liked it. And the you liked it. Uh, the okay. interesting thing really is that the, the taste of yeah. this one by 3000 is really close to the original Coke. It is, dude. I'm surprised actually. Like so. I'm really honest, by so, the way. But uh, to be fair, AI takes the data. So what data they might have fed, like whatever their product is selling of all the Coca-Cola. So come up with the recipe and maybe the ingredients and stuff. Sure. So obviously the original Coke is selling the most. So it kind of makes sense that the AI is also suggesting something which is close to Coke. But yeah, the taste is nice. I like it. All I have to say is if AI had a hand in making Coke Zero taste less like Coke Zero and taste like this, I, I kind of like the AI influence here. So let's uh, switch over to the next one. UK's AI ecosystem to hit $2.4 trillion by 2027, third in the global race. USA is still at the top and China's second. What can you tell me about that? So uh, there is an organization, I am forgetting the name. It is, uh, so they have predicted the uh, AI market for UK to be, to be $2.4 trillion. Uh, that is a lot given the fact that already UK's economy is a bit uh, of a tough spot. So still, they have predicted that 2.4 trillion US dollar for AI, it is pretty good news. And the best thing is, you can already see the uh, results about it. It is not like just they are uh, saying it. Uh, UK has already uh, started a project for a, a supercomputer, which is for 900 dollars or 900 euros which is 1.1 billion uh, dollars for a supercomputer, which would specifically used for development of AI and uh, advancement of AI so that uh, the UK is not behind in the race. And uh, they are also, uh, again, as we discussed earlier, they are also pushing the, uh, uh, the safety, how White House was doing it, right. the safety with the AI. Yeah, so and UK is typically a bit more regulated when it yes, comes to these yes, things. Yes, yes, They want to keep their country safe. Oh, yeah. No, but it's surprising that UK is actually so high on the list, considering the fact that they're such a small country, but they're really trying to command the presence in AI. I think that's pretty significant. I think it's smart. I think that these countries that are really trying to roll out an ecosystem for AI and for enterprises that are utilizing them. Mm -hmm. It's a smart play. It's something that is going to make a big impact in the economies over time. Like in the next 10 years, companies, that, countries that do adopt AI at a higher standpoint will do better. I think it's almost a natural consequence because yes, right now we don't have true AI, but when we start getting more sophisticated AIs that start to approach a more realistic <laughs> AGI, we'll say, it'll make a massive, it'll make a massive change in terms of the capacities for output that some of these countries will be able to produce. And 
governments that are aware of it are going to pivot and improve the status of the country overall. So it, I was a little bit surprised at the fact that UK was so high up on the, on the list, but I, I, maybe I shouldn't be surprised. Um, I'm curious to know where India falls under that, um, but that's something that we can probably look up further. Uh, yeah. talking, I, they, talking another uh, video. I know that uh, AI, the government is also pushing the AI right mm -hmm. now, but uh, like they are pushing it for uh, startups and they are trying to use it in public service as well right. for government websites and stuff. But I'm not sure about how they are using it for defense. They might be doing something, but I am not aware of the details right now. Of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This next little headline. Don't use ChatGPT to message your friends if you still want to have friends. <laughs> so a new study found that people perceive AI-generated messages to be low energy, and receiving AI-generated messages from friends make people feel more insecure about their relationship. What do you think about this development? Yeah, I think this, uh, what this study suggests is uh, it's pretty accurate. So it's pretty accurate because, see, if you are talking to your friend and you have to use chat GPT or something to uh, frame your sentences, so that is uh, how that is not your friend. Like him, tell that. Yeah, I, I mean, I kind of feel like if my if my aunt sent me an AI <laughs> message, I would think one, you are way too advanced in your knowledge of AI. <laughs> what are you doing, auntie? And two, I, I mean, I would kind of feel a little bit, I don't know, underappreciated. <laughs> Be, but I, I, can see the, I can see the benefit. I just don't see the implementation in using it to message people that you actually like know personally. But I, I know that there are certain people that will because their social circle is so big that they see the need to use it and so they will try to. But the question is, what happens when the chatbot that they use to message their friends is so good at replicating what they would say that it becomes imperceptible? Then it becomes a tool and I'm not necessarily sure that that tool should be used. <laughs> uh, yeah, it would be a like, more advanced version of the good morning family messages you would get from your uncles like doesn't mean too much why you are sending it but mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. still do so kind okay. of that thing <laughs> see this this feels bad just talking <laughs> about it because i'm now i'm thinking okay if i sent grandpa an ai generated <laughs> message and it made him feel good i think i would still feel bad that i sent him an ai message that would be kind of cheating <laughs> yeah, it would it would I don't, I don't think I would use it, but anyways, some people might. Now, this next one is interesting. AI Delphi wants to create digital clones of influencers. Training chatbots to capture a public figure's personality through vast online data, which is both promising and concerning. Startup aims to basically clone influencers with the help of AI. Um, I, I see the pros and cons with this. Like, I think... In some cases, it is probably a necessity because if you have a celebrity or if you have an influencer, like imagine Mr. Beast, right? Like Mr. Beast has so many subscribers, so many people that know him. There's a big percentage of people that want to reach out to him. He can't reach out to everybody. He can't talk to everybody. It's impossible. So what is a person like that to do, especially when he's receiving emails messages through Instagram. It's almost nicer. I think it would be better if there was a highly developed chatbot or, or AI that can communicate with his fan base on a more general kind of perspective for some of the things that, that they would communicate to him too. Because some of the questions, some of the comments, or even some of the communications that are probably directed at him can be answered by a simple, you know, Google lookup or what have you. So would that be the better option? That's the question. Yeah. Uh, so this particular uh, uh, development is 
kind of in the same uh, lines as the previous one about messaging it's, your friend uh, yes. using it for not it's a but gray the, zone but the thing is that uh, for uh, the example you used mr beast so for mr beast uh, he is like he's doing youtube commercially right he's a philanthropist but he still need to make money whatever he do with the money that is another thing but right. he need to make money right so if he can use that to increase his reach basically increase his business so not, i yeah, don't not, see anything bad in it but then comes well, the second right. thing about morality then again with the friend thing you are texting your friend using chat gpt but that is kind of personal with a friend uh, uh to put a perspective to it i will give you a, an example so on instagram you see many fitness influencer uh, they would say that if you join their paid course so they will give you one on one advice about bodybuilding and stuff sure nobody is doing that they have either people doing it or they have some pre made uh, charts yes. and stuff yes. so uh, listening to your uh, whining about that my body weight is this and that they will have one thing pre made they will paste it to you and you will feel like it is a personal nothing is personal like right. who is doing that right yeah yeah, and yeah how can you check it is on over instagram right, right. so now it is uh, it could be done in a more subtle way so you can do the same thing with using the knowledge of ai and what you want uh, like how you train your youtube algorithm right, right. what you search and what you believe yeah. kind of shows up so you can train the ai with all the knowledge on it, uh, on internet and what uh, you have learned and what is your essence and then you can uh, uh, target your audience in a more specific way again okay. there is a thing about morality but that is there i got you i think i i think i pinpointed the separation in terms of these two these two kind of polarities right with this kind of technology so what i think would be the best result is if you actually want to connect with these influencers like at an emotional level or at a on a personal level right this may not be an ideal technology for that i think a lot of people would be disillusioned if they found out that the person who they were talking to either through email or through a chatbot was AI. I think that would disconnect them a, a little bit because they would, they'd feel cheated. But if they were reaching out to these prominent individuals for information, and it just so happened that that information was within the chatbot itself, even if the person receiving the, the response from said influencer was receiving it from an AI, it wouldn't matter that much because what he's receiving is information that he may want. He may want like uh, a strategy for his business or for his YouTube channel or for a product that he's launching or maybe some artistic advice. And if the model has been trained on that data that that particular influencer or prominent figure has, then it's still useful because the end result is that that person got the information that he might need from that person. So that I think would be the, the correct separation. Um, but I could be wrong. Like there may be some people who just have so many followers like Mr. Beast, where some integration with AI may be necessary. Like um, I'll harken back to the movie Foundation. So one of the characters in the game, I mean in the movie made an uh, avatar of himself, an AI-based avatar that outlived him. And he was able to carry out a lot of things and his personality was basically almost exactly like the character. So there was no changes, but he was a necessary component in, in the later stages of the show. So there may be an AI that gets developed so well that it becomes almost exactly like Mr. Beast or, or any other, you know, celebrity. And that could still be something that allows the user or the, or the fan to connect to. And it's, it's very similar. So maybe that's enough. So this is my two cents on, on that. I think this is a, a technology that's super interesting. A little bit of a gray zone. There's some, 
there's some decisions that need to be made and I think the technology definitely has to be developed but over time I think it'll be very seamless and very sophisticated so this is almost kind of like a topic that almost deserves its own video but we're gonna carry on we're gonna move on to the next one new Google DeepMind maps algorithm improves routing by 24% on average. What are your thoughts on that? So uh, this is really interesting. So uh, the thing is the number 24% increasing the efficiency of an existing system. Google Maps is pretty accurate, right? Everybody uses it for going to their office, going anywhere. So increasing it yet by 24%, I think that is a, <coughs> that is a good jump. So what they have done, they have introduced a new system. If you are going from point A to point B, maybe there are two ways to it, but one way has a, a gate. Mm -hmm. It is a structure of gate which goes through private land. Okay. And the gate is always open, but it is a private land. So what the Google map will do, it will suggest you the longer route, mm -hmm. right? So, but now the thing is, it uh, whenever somebody passes through it, it will try to reward uh, that particular route so that it is suggested more. So uh, kind of these things uh, using a rewarding technique okay. to, for the betterment of their uh, map suggestion. So this 24% number you see is for two wheelers because uh, I think, I am not sure though, that it is easier for two wheeler to go anywhere, right? Right. Rather than a car. Car yeah. is obviously, it is harder with the car. Okay. So, so this is this is a big deal. Yeah, I think it is because okay. twenty four percent with the existing system. How good is Google Map? We all use it. Right. On right. a daily yeah. basis, it is pretty accurate. No, you're far more familiarized with this than, hmm. than me. I know you're more data oriented. When you heard this, I think you were pretty excited. Whereas I was kind of questioning. The the thing that got me excited was the number twenty four percent. Like, that is signif a significant yeah, and number. The thing is, it, it will be so good in more dense countries rather than oh, okay. if oh, you I see, see US. So if you see Asian and East Asian countries, those That's have lots of two-wheelers which are always going through these routes, which are oh, not showing on okay. Google Maps. That's interesting. No, that's really interesting. So this is uh, the 40% is from uh, testing phase. Let's see what it produces on the ground. Okay. So we will have some more solid evidence about it once we uh, see it, some report on it. Sounds good, sounds yeah. good. Okay guys, well, I think this wraps up our video, but I hope you guys liked it. And if you do, please like and subscribe. Thank you.